Marseille 2000, and Federer reaches his first ATP final. Despite his inexperience, Roger's first 18 months as a professional see him rocket through the rankings to become the youngest player in the world's top 100. In the final, he faces Mark Rossi, a fellow member of Switzerland's Davis Cup team, and 11 years at the senior. C'était dur parce que je vais gagner cette 6 au troisième, c'est un ou deux points que, voilà, que j'ai gagné en plus que lui. Et je pense que ce jour-là, lui, comme il avait 18 ans ou 19 ans, je ne sais plus, c'est ce qu'il a dû se penser. Il a dû dire peut-être que je ne serai plus jamais en finale et que je ne gagnerai pas un tournoi de la TP et que j'ai raté l'occasion. third season as a professional came the realization that talent alone would not be enough. Physical preparation was the key, and to this end, an old friend was recruited, Pierre Paganini, his endurance trainer from his days at the Swiss National Tennis Center. Donc il jouait déjà incroyablement bien, euh, et c'est vrai que ses capacités athlétiques étaient peut-être à un moment donné presque pas assez bonne par rapport à son jeu qui évoluait à une vitesse incroyable. On s'est dit à l'époque qu'on allait faire un plan de trois ans pour vraiment faire une construction athlétique complète. Il fallait que l'athlète puisse travailler à fond pour exploiter tout son potentiel, mais aussi il fallait que le jeu de jambes devienne plus précis. Il fallait donc qu'on puisse faire du travail basique, du travail basique, mais aussi du travail spécifique. Et on a fait ça sur plusieurs phases de 3 à 4 semaines, 3 fois par année, en 2000, 2001, 2002. Federer went into the 2001 season far better prepared than ever before. And almost immediately, his hard work began to pay dividends. In Milan, Roger reached his third ATP final. For me, it was a big one because I thought like, oh God, when am I going to ever get my first title, you know? And uh, so you start thinking this way and it all gets complicated in your head, you know, you think like maybe I'm going to become one of those guys who are never going to fulfill the talent, you know, that everybody talks about. So winning Milan took pressure off my shoulders and maybe like this you can look forward and say, whatever happens now, I got the title, I'm on the board. So maybe you can play more relaxed after that. Since turning professional, Federer had been coached by former Swedish pro Peter Lundgren, who had overseen Marcelo Rios's rise to world number one. It was good, you know, because we could talk about basically everything, and uh, you know, I had big respect for him as a player and uh, trusted him because he knew the game and he knows, you know, what to do. You just have to try to keep him focused and, and uh, keep him in a good spirit and also, you know, work on his weaknesses. Backhand was so-so, he was using the slice, more or less, because his legs were not uh, developed yet, and uh, that was a lot of things we could work on. Since winning the junior championships in 1998, Federer hadn't won a single match at the All England Club. But in the summer of 2001, he entered the tournament in the best form of his career. He would play his first ever match in the Cathedral of Tennis, second court. And it would be no ordinary opponent. The winner of seven of the last eight championships. On the grass of SW19. Eight seconds was the master. Well, I saw the draw, first of all, and I saw fourth round Pete Sampras in Wimbledon, center court, obviously. Honestly, for some reason, I did believe I could beat him. So I got on court, it's a real moment, first time at Wimbledon, first time against Sampras, and very nervous, cold hands, sweaty, you know, like disbelief, I'm on the center court against him, and once the match started, you, you feel like you're, it goes automatically. You know, 
stop thinking of who you're playing against, what the score is and everything. You just try to win your serve. Game at third set. I actually played pretty good. I didn't feel like I played poorly. You know, Roger, I was, um, you know, surprised that he served volley as much as he did. He was coming on both serves. The shift from volley game he played, it was just so fantastic how he had the courage to do it. And, I mean, he played Sampras also as Sampras did himself on a serve from volley. Actually, I returned the surf pretty good, so I was like, this is a good thing against Sampras at Wimbledon, you know, this is where it's going to be the most difficult to ever return the guy. I remember I had a break point to surf for the match and he had a, a great forehand up the middle. I just remember that point and how it went down. came together, I played this most incredible match and I realized really the importance of Wimbledon it makes out of tennis players and makes them superstars, you know. It's a tough loss because it was my fifth one I was going for and he, uh, he got me. It was uh, kind of the changing of the guard, so to speak. Roger looked sort of fairly relaxed all the time, right until the very end and of course when you hit that last winner then you could see the emotion completely drained out and that's when you thought, yes, all right, he's there, he's arrived, he's beaten the number one in the world, and I think then most people thought that, yes, there was the champion in the making. His victory made headlines around the world. Pistol Pete had been gunned down, but could Roger now take his crown? Being Sampras, you're supposed to be the handman now too, but I'm only 19, 20 years old, so I can't expect too much, but I was expecting myself to win against Henman. Losing was very hard. I took it very bad too. If you look at the handshake, it wasn't very, very nice to me towards Tim. Two six, seven, six. Today he's one of my best friends on tour. You know, so I almost feel bad for the handshake I, I gave him at Wimbledon. I, I don't know whether he's, you know, so disgusted at um, the volley that he missed, but basically he was sort of looking at his bag as he shook my hand, and that was probably the last unsporting gesture that he's he's made. Despite the quarter-final loss, Federer's defeat of Sampras had thrust him firmly into the media spotlight. Even the traditionally reserved Swiss were quick to honor his achievement. Roger was now ranked number 13 in the world, but he was not quite the finished article. However, the encore displays of frustration were about to be conquered. He lost the match point, he smacked his racket, and then he said, okay, that's the last racket I, I will smack in my career. He did, just decided like that, and uh, from that point, he, I think he almost never broke a racket anymore. And uh, I think it, it shows how, uh, how strong he is mentally, because he decided something, and when he takes a decision, he, he stays that way.